Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Five years ago, my wife and I decided to take a weekend break. The hotel we chose was a hotel named the Barony Castle Hotel on the outskirts of Peebles on the Scottish border. The hotel itself lay in acres of land surrounded by forest. While getting dressed for an evening meal, my wife was sat at the dressing table while I was standing by the bed when suddenly the television, which stood on the other side of the room, switched itself on. It stayed on for a few minutes, then switched itself off again. It did this about three times. Neither my wife or myself felt phased by this until the following morning while we were checking out. The receptionist said to us, Oh, I see you were in the haunted room last night. When we told her what had happened, she said the room was haunted by a maid who had once worked at the hotel. She said that others had reported being woken up by a lady who would stand at the bottom of the bed staring at them as they slept. Others had witnessed the TV switching on and off as we did. We didn't at any time feel threatened in any way, but in fact have visited the same hotel on many occasions. The Barony Castle Hotel can be googled, and the story of the haunting is there for all to read. It was about 10 p.m. in late June when this happened, and it really creeped me out. I live in Columbia in the countryside. I was forced one day to move my PC to our third floor studio to get a better signal from the modem in our house. While I was setting up the PC, I noticed that my iPhone's iCloud storage was so large that it could not actually complete a backup. This made me spend the next half an hour clearing my phone of old junk I no longer used. Lastly, I began to erase old pictures that I didn't wish to keep anymore. I cleared almost all of the photos, leaving just the oldest ones. There, in the top row next to the very first photograph that I took with my phone of my dogs, was a really very creepy photo of a kid with black eyes just staring into the camera it was a very disturbing image. I have no idea where this picture came from. It was very old and I think I would have noticed it earlier, but the photo seemed to have appeared from nowhere. I tried tapping on the photo to enlarge it and get a better look at it to see if I could discern anything else, but instead the photo app crashed. When I went back after the crash, the picture was gone, while every other picture was still there. I still have absolutely no idea where it came from. I didn't take the photo. I don't know anyone who would send me such a picture. This is not made up. It really happened and it scared me to death. I spent the next hour and a half looking for any possible answer. 
I often think about finding that photo on my phone, and today I found this site and decided to post my story. It may not get posted, but it at least clears my mind. At least someone else knows about this. I learned about black-eyed kids a few years ago through some of these odd conspiracy TV shows that sometimes pop up in Discovery Channel and such, but I was never really convinced about it until that picture just popped up without any reasonable explanation. How did the photo get there? It makes me shudder to think about it. As a young teenager, I was very close friends with the son of a geologist. My friend and his family used to spend much of their vacation time in Oregon and California exploring the ancient caves. One year, they invited me to go with them. When we got to the caves, my friend's father told us to take a sweater and a flashlight because it was very cold and very dark inside the caves. Me and my friend came to the entrance of the cave and his parents and sisters followed. When we were walking through the cave, there was a bunch of these little cul-de-sacs to our left and right. I went with my friend into one. It was called Lucifer's Corner. We stayed in there for around five minutes, just looking around and realized that we were alone. Being stupid teenagers, we turned off our flashlights and stood in the pitch-black darkness of this ancient cave. You could not even see your hand inches from your face. This was kind of random, but I told my friend to say Bloody Mary three times. He did, and nothing happened. So we fired up our flashlights and headed for the exit. The caves were starting to get boring. Once you've seen one cave, you've seen them all, right? We back out into the daylight. We couldn't find his family, so we assumed that they were back inside the caves. My friend and I went back to the entrance, entered the cave, and walked through once again. We eventually came back to Lucifer's Corner, where my friend and I had been before. We noticed that there were three lit candles melted on the cave wall in the same spot where my friend had chanted the Bloody Marys. It didn't take anything else to make us turn around and bolt toward the exit. When we got outside, we were breathing heavily, trying to catch our breath. We were both trying to come up with an explanation of why the candles were there, but there just wasn't one. The first house we lived in was alive with spirits. My parents didn't like to mention it, but it was. I was probably four at the time when I first noticed it. We were having a family reunion at our house and had the whole family over. Lots of food, lots of play, and lots of fun to be had with my cousins. I remember being tired and wanting to go to sleep just when the sun went down, so I went to my room and fell asleep. The party was still going on downstairs. I woke up to someone knocking at my window, but it wasn't a polite knock. It was like pounding with urgency. I didn't think anything of it except that it was probably one of my cousins being mean or something. But the knocking hadn't stopped. It was just a constant knocking. I got out of bed to see who it was. I walked over to the window and opened my curtains, and while the loud knocking was still happening, there was no one there in front or on the side of the window. I remember breathing, getting really heavy and tears forming in my eyes. I couldn't move, I was so scared. Somehow I broke free of this paralysis and ran out to the living room, which was empty other than the TV being on, the clock on the wall that said it was almost 4 a.m. and my mother fast asleep on the couch. It definitely wasn't my cousins at that time. Another encounter took place around the same period. I woke up early in the morning while everyone was still asleep. I was making a bowl of cereal in the kitchen when I started to feel kind of weird. 
I opened the fridge door to get the milk, and I looked toward the other end of the kitchen and saw a hand, just a hand, slowly fingering for me to come here. I did, right away as a matter of fact, thinking it was my dad, but when I turned the corner, no one was around. They were all sleeping still. There were other things that happened, but what I do remember strongly is never feeling alone. Even if I was home alone, the house would feel alive. I think a lot happened in that place, and I do believe some of it was not good. started like any other. Some kids came to my door. I was alone in the house playing video games when this long knock came to the door. I could see through the curtain on the door that it was just some kids, and living in a neighborhood with several families with kids, this was nothing out of the ordinary. Yet before I even opened the door, I began to feel extremely wary. I opened it to find two boys around 12 or 13 standing on my porch. The taller boy had knocked, the smaller had been straddling a bike. I found this odd that he was on my porch on his bike. He would have had to carry it up my front steps and instead of standing beside it, was sitting on it. At first they kept their heads down and I asked if I could help them. They said they just needed to come in for a minute and it wouldn't take long. I asked if they were from the neighborhood and they didn't answer me. It was about this time that I realized something wasn't right. They kept trying to get in and I kept telling them that they couldn't. They didn't get impatient or mad, they just kept trying to get me to invite them in. I felt that they were absolutely draining all the energy from my body. It was a battle. I can tell you without a doubt that yes, they are real. They are evil by nature and you do not want them around you, near you, or able to touch you. In October of 1971, some friends of mine told me about the old Confederate cemetery across the river from Fort Smith, Arkansas in the small town of Laveka. Trying to frighten me because I'm from Michigan, they challenged me to go to the cemetery on Halloween night. With me driving and my friends giving me the directions, off we went to Laveka to see the ghosts of the Civil War. The cemetery was right next to this small white church that we had to drive down a narrow lane between orchards to get to. There was a clock on a timer in the steeple that gonged for every hour. That Halloween night, when the clock struck 12, the clock gonged 13 times, not 12. When I looked over to my left at the grave markers, I and everyone else started to see a mist rising from behind the markers. Everyone was trying to get me to drive off. One of my friends said we had to leave. When I finally did try to drive off, the car didn't want to. Now, I'm no mechanic, but when a person puts her foot on the gas pedal and pushes it halfway to the floor of the car, the car should respond by going faster than five or six miles an hour. But that's what our car was doing. By this time, I had the gas pedal to the floor and the car was still only going five miles an hour. As I looked out the left driver's window, there was a ghostly shape of a Confederate officer floating next to my window with his right arm stretched out to me. I shook my head and yelled to him that I couldn't help him, and he dropped his arm and slowly started to move back from the window. When I looked over to the right, there was another ghostly soldier floating along there. In the rearview mirror, I could see at least three or four old soldiers there with their hands on the trunk of the car. About that time, the front wheels touched the pavement 
of the road between the orchards we were in and the orchards across the road from us, and the car shot out from under me. I had to do some fancy driving so we wouldn't hit one of the trees now in front of us. We didn't. When I looked up, we were now facing the other lane we had just left, and we could see the ghostly soldiers floating back into the cemetery. The next year, 1972, I tried to get someone, anyone, to go back with me to the old cemetery. No one would go with me to see if the ghosts would reappear. I returned to California in September of 1973, and as far as I know, no one else has gone back to that old Confederate cemetery. The Impusa originally appeared in the mythology of classical Greece as a frightening female monster. She is the demonic vampire without shape of its own, but with the ability to appear in many different animal guises and as a beautiful, tempting young woman. Modern-day Greek folklore still speaks of the Impusa, who enters the body of its human prey, particularly children, to consume the flesh and blood of its victim. She loves to eat young and beautiful bodies and drink their blood because it's strong and pure. The monster thrives in water and on land, so they tend to dwell along the coast. Lurking on the darkened roads at night, Ampusa seeks its prey. Ampusa represents the Grecian form of a vampire. In the Greek myth, this female demon is usually described as having one prosthetic leg made of brass and the other leg of a donkey. From the waist up, Impusa is a human-like creature with hideous blemishes and blotches on her skin. She was said to have been the daughter of the goddess of witchcraft, the night, moon, ghosts, and necromancy, Hecate, and was sent by her to torment people, especially travelers. Impusa, the shapeshifter, changes its apparition into an animal or to a beautiful woman. She lures it over to drink its blood and consume its flesh. An ancient story about a 25-year-old man of Lycia, Menippus, who is a smart, handsome, and exceptionally well-built man as an athlete, relates an encounter with this evil creature. One day, as Menippus walks along the road, he is met by an apparition, an impusa, in the guise of a foreign woman. She is the Phoenician, and under her spell, he falls in love with her unaware of what she really is, they make plans to marry. Apollonius is rather skeptical of her. He attends the wedding and is introduced to her by Menippus. This very rich woman is the mistress of all the servants. Hearing this, Apollonius tells Menippus that his wonderful bride is nothing but a vampire who, like others in her race, loves to devour the flesh and blood of its victims. Manipus's bride is offended and orders Apollonius to leave, but his words have already broken her spell, and all the gold, silver, and the servants vanished. Pretending to weep, the Impusa begs Apollonius not to force her to confess what she really is, but he does. Finally, she admits she usually chooses her victims among young and beautiful people to dine on them, and Menippus is one of them. Belief in this evil monster persists into modern times. Present-day shepherds blame her for accidents that happen to their animals, claiming that she suddenly appears, hurts them, and disappears again. Later tales describe a whole race of these monsters, the Impusa, living on the North African coast in Libya. The Impusa is the early Greek term for the later Latin term Lamaya. Over the ages, the descriptions of Impusa changed considerably and were often confused with Lamaya. Ancient people believed that the only defense against these monsters was abusing them verbally or shouting insults. As a result, they screamed and fled away. Except for the Greek account of Impusa, the same awful creature is known in other ancient cultures of the Mediterranean region.
the Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love The Last Observer – A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. So, three friends and I decided we were going to camp out in this 30-acre sanctuary down the street from my neighborhood. It's paralleled by railroad tracks and a road on one side and then a small road on the other side. There's a lot of forest and trails, but also these big sand dunes and a huge lake that's pretty deep. So deep we can't see the bottom. And in Florida, there's always stuff to worry about, like mosquitoes at night and spider webs along the wooded paths. Snakes, thankfully, left us alone. Now, understand, when I say three friends, I mean two friends and sort of my friend's uncle. So that's Brandon, Dalton, and Mike. Brandon is cool when it comes to nature and a survivalist guy. Dalton's my best friend and he's funny, but can get freaked out as easily as me. Then there's Mike, the horrible uncle with the shit-eating grin that you'd never let your kids hang out with. He is awesome. We settled on three nights, so we got ourselves a big tent and brought two coolers worth of stuff out there. The sun's high up in the sky and there's no clouds anywhere to be seen. It was a lovely day in autumn, which meant it wasn't nearly as hot as Florida sounds like. As we unload our truck at the front of the trail, we kind of had to hide the truck because there are no trespassing signs in a few places, but I see people out here occasionally, so I think it more or less was a dumping warning. We noticed that there are absolutely no footprints this time. I thought that was odd, but Mike just drew a dick in the sand. So as we're walking out there, Brandon is explaining that this area used to be home to the Ayas tribe that was fond of East Florida. It was interesting to listen to because apparently they built both mounds and thatched huts and stuff like that. Mike asked us if we'd ever heard of a banshee. To this, I sort of facepalmed and Dalton laughed. Mike even chuckled and said he'd keep it for the night. We lugged our stuff some ways, passing a few retention ponds and an open area towards the railroad crossing and had a drainage ditch on the other side. The trail ran down pretty far until it turned into a huge scrublands area that then turned into another scrubland cut off by huge trees. You know, the kind of huge tree that's so thick you can't tell if it's just now popping out of the ground or not. I always thought the place was cool, but I wasn't sure how I'd feel being there overnight. We passed the big trees and it opened up into a shaded place with pine leaves forming their own little hills and then the huge sand dunes hugged by the Floridian forest. Then, just touching the right tip of the place, was this body of water we nicknamed Willow Lake. Most of the place was either sand or little shrubbery pushing up out of it, and right along the banks of the lake was a downed telephone line God knows how old. We decided to lug our stuff up the side of the dunes because they turned into some secluded trails. We found the opportune location, too. It was a huge open area of sand with a patch of tree jutting up on the outskirts from the left side of the entrance, and then all wood on the right side spare for a small path that seemed barely beaten. This is where we would set up shop. Within the hour, we had the huge tent up and Brandon went off with Dalton to collect some firewood. Florida's really bad on that part, so we'd use palm fronds to get the fire going and use actual wood to keep it burning. Good thing to know in Florida because the Skeeters hate thick smoke. Since I was at the campsite with just Uncle Mike, he'd brought some gin and popped it open. 
I'd never had alcohol in my life, and I was just now 18, so I knew he'd try to have me drink some. Sure enough, here you go, Rob. I told him no, naturally, but my own curiosity was getting to me. I knew Dalton would jump at the chance to drink some gin or Mountain Bush, and I knew Brandon would side with me. I told him to wait until the others returned. That way, I'd at least have someone to agree with. That's when we heard it the first time. A wail that sounded like it came from at the base of the dunes. It was so close the hairs on the back of my neck were livid for seconds. Mike just laughed and cupped his hands. Will you silly nanny stop playing in the sand? Just as he had said that, Dalton stepped out of the woods, firewood in arms and into the campsite to ask what all of that was. Mike and I asked him where Brandon was and he thumbed over his shoulder that he was still carrying some palm fronds with him. You mean you weren't the ones who just made that wailing down there? Mike asked him, folding his arms together. Mike, I'm being completely serious right now. You'd know if I was fucking with you. Mike sighed deeply and told him to bring Brandon back to the camp. He turned to me. Rob, you're coming with me. I looked awkward and asked him why, since I wasn't used to being entirely alone with the guy. Because if this turns out to be dirty Mike and the boys, I need someone to trip so I can get away. So I went with him. We walked down the sand dunes, having to pick our feet up because of the sand. And when we got to the bottom, we did a scan of the area. Honestly, the only thing that had changed was the position of the sun and the brightness of the horizon. It was now dusk barely dark, but getting there. I turned to Uncle Mike, who was rather puzzled himself, and asked him what he thought it was. He just said it had to be a Tyrannosaurus in heat. I couldn't help but laugh at that. Mike was definitely the comic relief of us, but even he looked a little concerned. He said he brought the machete for woodcutting, but told me it was inside the tent, near the back, if I needed it. We shrugged the whole thing off after that and swapped some stories around the campfire. Thankfully, the mosquitoes were nowhere to be found. Brandon continued to tell us more about the location and how the Aes were also hunter-gatherers. That meant they didn't farm or grow anything, but they hunted animals and gathered resources to survive. Dalton told us about some of the spooky stories he'd read online late at night and, for the most part, some of what he told us was genuinely spooky. Mike even contributed by telling us more about the Banshees and how they wailed and the person would always die nearby, but that sounded rather vague. Mike opened his mouth and screamed horrifyingly after the silence settled in, and Brandon was shaking his ass off. Of course, we all laughed at him and told him the Banshee was going to get him. Yeah, the rest of the night consisted of Mike fucking with Brandon. There was even one moment in the tent where Mike told him, Calm down, Brandy. Banshees only show up when there's a flash of light. After a few seconds, Mike lightly held down the button on the flashlight and Brandon screamed. The next day we woke up and went about our business of taking a piss off in the woods or going down to the lake just to enjoy the morning breeze, but I noticed something odd. Upon walking down the reclusive hill, there was something amiss in the dunes themselves. I saw our footprints, which were hugely distorted due to the sand, and then I saw what appeared to be deep impressions, like something on all fours had bolted up the hill or down it. They were just so perfect that it couldn't be real. I'm paranoid about these things, so I constantly had my eyes glued to the trails that we came from and others we hadn't checked out yet, which I knew if we were, I'd be bringing Brandon or all of them along. I really didn't feel like going alone after the whale yesterday. I sat on the downed telephone pole to wash my face off from the water, and that's when I noticed it. Mike's bottle of gin, still half-filled like he left it, just dropped in the sand in front of me. I blinked blankly, figuring Mike must have wandered out last night or early in the morning and drunkenly left it there. I went back to our spot where Dalton brought more wood to and asked Uncle Mike about his bottle. He tilted his head and asked me where I found it. I told him down by the lake. He 
and told me to stop fucking with him. You didn't get up early in the morning and take it down there? He told me no, but I raised my eyebrow at him. So you weren't hammered? I sounded like an idiot, sure, but knowing Mike, he could be hatching some kind of prank on us as we spoke. Bottom line was he said he didn't move it, so I just gave him the gin and sat down at the camp. It was pretty lazy for the rest of the morning. All we did was eat some of our canned stuff and decided which trails we'd go down. Naturally, since the place we were at is connected to an actual nature park, we thought we'd try seeing if we could reach it, so we chose the path going around the side of Willow Lake. Mike stayed behind and made some phone calls while we went out there since animals could have gotten into our shit if we just left it. This little dirt road had the retention ditch adjacent to it, with big tilapia swimming freely and at least a 12-foot stumble if someone tripped, and boy, it was far. By 2 p.m., we'd probably walked at least three miles or so, and I could barely believe that myself. The place was supposed to be 30 acres, and the fact that this trail rarely curved or made a turn bothered me at how far we'd gotten from the sand dunes. The only thing we had here were jagged trees and overlying canopy of Spanish moss and the just barely audible noise of the highway, so we weren't entirely that far from civilization. Our big problem now was that the path split into three. They all looked the same, spare for the center being riddled with pine needles, so we went down the mid-path, figuring less sand meant easier walking. The wail again from yesterday. As soon as I heard it in front of us, I teared up. Consider myself a pussy, but I knew it wasn't Mike screwing with us. There was no way he could have been ahead at this rate. Brandon was giving us worried looks, but he brought out his six-inch knife and Dalton told me to lie low. We were all speaking so softly that it was almost surreal. Brandon, though, easily spooked, seemed so calm here. He slowly went ahead, minding where he put his footsteps because the pine needles didn't actually make too much of a noise. So while he slowly progressed 20 yards ahead of us, and also remember that the trail is pretty isolated in the forest at this point, Dalton and I covered our six. We noticed something really strange just lying off to the hedge of the pine-needled path. I wanted to say no, I wanted to deny every ounce of it, but there was no denying the fact that an unopened can of mountain bush was right here, far from our camp. The damn thing still had precipitation on it. I told Dalton I was really fucking scared right now, and he nodded and nudged me towards Brandon. We decided we'd head back to the camp and tell Mike about it. Something entered our peripheral vision, a blurring mix of gray and white ran from one side of the path to the other. One thing I remember definitely were three bony fingers on each hand passing through the bush and leaving nearly no trace that it was there. I've never seen Brandon hop to his feet and sprint as quick as he did, but we were all on our feet. As a matter of fact, I've never seen my own two feet work like they did. We forgot taking the can back and just ran as fast as we possibly could back to the lake. And we didn't stop there. We ran up the sand dunes, nearly collapsing because of the thick sand, and shouted for Mike. Mike wasn't there. Are you freaking kidding me? I thought. We shouted for Mike for several minutes, looking all around. Brandon checked the cooler and did a count of our stuff while Dalton kept pacing back and forward, calling Mike on his phone. What are you sissies screaming about? Mike answered from the phone. We found out he'd walked back to the truck to go to the 7-Eleven down the road, but he told us he was pulling back up. He asked us if we were really going to pussy out of our only time together over break, and we decided we would just meet him at the front and tell him what happened. Screw staying behind at the camp, none of us were man enough to do it after what we just witnessed. We made our way back past the two large trees and down the long trail until we found Mike walking up with a bag of potato chips and some water. He thought our expressions were hilarious but asked us what was going on. Once we told him, he was almost in disbelief. Mike asked us if we took his machete, and I answered no. He told us we should consider knowing where it is if we seriously saw something. 
The rest of the day consisted of us staying near the tent, not really going anywhere alone anymore. We had all stepped down near the lake because Dalton and I started goofing around. We were wrestling, causing a huge dust cloud from rolling down the dunes. Mike loved it because I was being so desperate to kick Dalton's ass, yet I wasn't built like he was. And Mike, seeing another opportunity to mess with Brandon, did the banshee cry yet again. Only this time, off in the distance. The same wail from before answered him. We all looked at each other and said, what the fuck? At nearly the same time. This was when Mike stood up and scanned the perimeter, making his own checks of everything. See, Rob, this is why you need to get your concealed weapons permit, he said, walking down to help us up. When I asked him why, he answered, you really think I'm allowed to carry a gun? We weren't very talkative the rest of the night. We sat around the campfire, paranoid, tried roasting some marshmallows and playing some music from our cell phones, but it was hard to shake the feeling that we were under surveillance. You know, like there could be big red eyes somewhere, just watching, waiting. Mike kept his machete by his legs and Brandon had taken his own knife and carved the end of this long stick to make a spear. This is how spooked we really were. There was something out here, and we were alone. Look, guys, if you really want to just get the fuck out of here, we can. I'll, I'll just drive us back to Rob's place. At that point, we were all ready to get up and go, so there were no objections. Some camping trip this turned out to be. Mike stood up and lit a cigarette for a few moments, then muttered profanities to himself. He turned to us with a half grin, half frown. You guys are going to hate me. I I think I dropped my car keys. Of course, we all gawked and asked him if he was serious or if he was just messing with us. Because, of course, Mike's been known to do that, but he was serious. He fanned out his pockets and checked all over camp using his cell phone as a light. So that's really it. We were fucking stuck here, unless we wanted to walk the whole way back to my house. And frankly, we were tired, and our hearts were still pounding from earlier. We just wanted to dig in and hold until daylight. We would cut this trip short, making it two days instead of three. So we all huddled like frightened animals in the middle of the tent. That primal fear kicked in of being exposed or being towards the outside of the tent Mike slept next to his machete, keeping his shoulder on it. Brandon and I couldn't sleep, and Dalton drank some of Mike's gin to try and keep him from sleeping. Brandon was petrified and told me not to close my eyes. His paranoia made it harder on my own, and we kept ourselves up for as long as I can remember. We heard the mosquitoes on the outside of the tent. We heard some splashing down near the lake, and we heard a train horn eerily pass by. It must have been three hours before we finally started settling in. I was about to bury myself in my sleeping bag when my ears sprang alert. There was a thumping of sand being thrown around. It was getting closer and more to our ground level. I dared not sit up, but I started to tear up once more. That thing was bolting up the hill and into our campsite, just like it probably did the night before. I held my breath as the thing's heavy breathing passed on my side of the tent. Its footfalls weren't too powerful, the thing appeared like it was trying to sneak around. It also slowed down now that it was on even terrain. Now I couldn't help it. I turned slowly and silently to see Brandon's eyes completely open, staring straight at me. He was shitting bricks so bad, but I wasn't going to call him out on anything. This was horrifying, and I really thought about the possibility that this monster could kill us with those long, bony fingers. While it sulked around the camp and went through our cooler, I nodded toward Mike's machete. Brandon tried to take it, but Mike was too heavy, so we had to wake everyone up. I brought a hand out and suggested prodding Mike with his stick, so we did. Mike quietly groaned, but we covered his mouth. Before he could object, we heard the cooler spill and all the shit pour out. The thing outside grunted and its heavy breathing panicked for a moment before subsiding. The thing's fingers were tapping on the insides and it lapped up the water like a big dog would. Mike wanted to whisper, but we frantically shook our heads against the idea. So instead of talking, he mouthed stuff to us. 
It was hard to understand him, but he reluctantly spoke, Wake up, Dalton. Sit up slowly. We all remained silent, for the night around us had as well. We were almost terrified that it heard him. I couldn't stop shaking, as if I got the chills, but we were reassured that the thing was still there because it started digging in the sand for some reason, and the sand smashed against the outside of our tent like we were being pelted with tiny pebbles. We pushed on Dalton's shoulder and he muttered, what? Mike sat up and held the machete ready because the thing outside stopped digging in the sand. We clasped our hands over his mouth and whispered into his ear to sit up slowly, which he did with uneasiness. The thing was casting a shadow over our tent now. It was just taller than Mike, who was prime in that category here. Like a grizzly bear or something, it stood to full height to observe the tent. It had to be at least 10 feet away, right against the heavy forest. And since we were all on our knees inside the tent, we weren't even half of its height. Uncle Mike raised the blade, his own tattooed hands shaking. The monster moved its legs and stalked towards our tent. It extended an arm to poke the tent, running its delicate fingers across the fibers. Its breathing pushed in on the tent and out. The shadow gradually turned and its hands ran over the entrance, particularly along the zipper line. I was literally holding Dalton's hand in a complete maternal instinct. This was real. This was a real nightmare, a story you'd read or a movie you'd watch, and I was in the middle of it. My heart was pounding so hard that I could not only hear it but feel it in every ounce of my body. He could feel it too as he squeezed my hand. Even Brandon, who was sitting by himself, was literally losing his shit in the calmest way imaginable. Because if we weren't calm, I thought we'd be dead. The fingers finally found the zipper. It fiddled and experimented with it, and the thing looked like it had difficulty understanding. It pulled out on the tent, moving us a few inches. Then it pulled up, started unzipping the tent. It was halfway unzipped when Mike struck. He lunged out at it, swiping the thing across its arm and the monster letting out a shrill that could boil blood. We all screamed, seeing the thing roll around in the sand with Mike grunting to stay on it. They knocked over the ash pile and the partially burnt bonfire and dust was in the air everywhere. It was horrible because we didn't know what to do. We were sitting here watching my best friend's uncle fight off a creature with his blade and we weren't sure who was winning. I don't even remember much of the fighting. I just recall being petrified at the skeletal humanoid monster that in the middle of this fight had glowing yellow eyes and snarled like something neither from hell nor earth. Brandon took both Dalton and I by the arms and ushered us down the hill. Dalton didn't want to leave Mike, but Brandon said tough shit and told him we were going to dig in. I reminded him that this thing was six feet tall and fast, but it didn't matter to us anyway. We were in the sand dunes, in pitch black, and there was absolutely nothing keeping it from bolting down the dunes and ripping us apart. We saw them hurtling down the hill, Mike literally punching the thing now with his fists. He didn't even have the big knife in his hands anymore until I noticed it was protruding from the creature's gut. And what's worse is the thing was digging its claws into his shoulder. It looked damaging, like someone dragging a dissection tool across the skin. In their struggle, the thing must have rocked back and forth because his neck was pretty diced. Now with Mike bleeding from his neck, we really knew we had to do something or else he could die or we could all die. So Mike groaning from his pain finally kicks the thing off of him and stands up. He's literally dripping blood down his shoulders. The creature, on the other hand, just sits there, its body churning inwards and outwards, catching its breath and recuperating. We all hauled ass, fuck everything back at the camp. The sand made it difficult to sprint, and that made things even scarier. The thing could lunge and snatch any of us at the rate that we were going. It was like trudging through heavy snow. Thank God for Brandon's heritage. He told us how the Mohawk Indians ran. He suggested that we run their way or stick to the side of the path once we got back on it and it would keep us from sinking into the dune. We were at the bottom when it wailed and we heard it charging after us. It was already flying for all I knew from the adrenaline pouring into my veins. The sound of breaking glass shocked me, but I didn't stop running. I ran faster than any of them. I passed the two big trees and got out of the shrubbery. 
and I passed the second large lake and I reached the truck. I had covered the distance so fast that my chest was about to explode from pain. My asthma was acting up and I started having trouble breathing. I didn't even bring an inhaler because I hadn't used it in so long. I found Mike's keys on the ground next to the car tires and just grabbed them. I couldn't do anything right now with my heart pounding and my lungs in anguish. I didn't even realize I left anybody behind in the dust and frankly, the only thought on my mind was the horrible creature. A few moments later, Dalton and Brandon came hauling Mike over and put him in the back seat of the truck. I gave them the keys and without them asking me if I was alright, got in the truck and Dalton took the wheel. We turned on the truck and its engine revved up. The headlights came on and the yellow eyes reflected while it continued crawling for us. Dalton shouted the Lord's name and put his foot down on the pad. We ran the thing over, causing a huge thump. After that, we backed all the way out of the trail and without paying any mind, we sped off down the roadways to the nearest hospital. Mike was in ICU for days until they managed to save him. As for us, well, we told our folks what had happened. They thought we were all dropping acid. They wouldn't let us see each other or Mike for months until some hiker got killed out in the place we were at. The whole city was in panic over this fiasco and nobody wanted to leave their homes. No other killing happened. The police did a huge sweep of the nature park and although they did find the remains and everything we reported, they found no creature, not even the blood. The mayor's response was to completely seal off the nature park and the 30 acres beside it and the city made it illegal and punishable by fine to enter anywhere around it. I finally got to ask Mike what happened only a few months back. He told me the breaking glass was his bottle of gin with his last sip he'd been saving against the thing's face. Said he cut it up pretty badly. I've never set foot in the forest down here ever since. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big heavy breakfast, I just grab one of my Built Bars, the best tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert or even a meal like breakfast with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. America is full of historic bridges, and nearly all of them have a ghostly reputation. Such is the case with the Poinsett Bridge in Landrum, South Carolina, a 195-year-old bridge said to be the site of mysterious lights, strange sounds, and frightening apparitions. But are the stories true, or are they nothing more than local lore? The History of Poinsett Bridge Built in 1820, Poinsett Bridge is the oldest surviving span in South Carolina. The bridge was once part of a road that connected Charleston and Columbia to the mountain communities of North Carolina. It's now the titular landmark in the 120-acre Poinsett Bridge Heritage Preserve in Landrum, South Carolina. Thought to be designed by the same architect who designed the Washington Monument, Poinsett Bridge is a popular tourist attraction and it is listed on the United States National Register of Historic Places. But Poinsett Bridge? Haunted? Unlike some haunted bridges, Poinsett Bridge has no clear backstory. One legend claims a lynched slave haunts the span, while another attributes the haunting to Indians and lost burial grounds. A third legend claims a mason died during the bridge's construction and is now entombed inside. 
To my knowledge, there is no historical evidence to support any of these stories. Historical evidence or not, many people think something strange is afoot at Poinsett Bridge. One paranormal investigation team noted unexplained red and white lights in the vicinity of the bridge, while a photo revealed a mist of man-sized proportion. That same team recorded an EVP that sounded like a human heartbeat. Another team reported significant EMF spikes, which is notable as the bridge is in a remote mountain area with no power lines. They also saw a large white figure that one woman believed to be the spirit of an Indian shaman. Other creepy reported incidents include unexplained screams, eerie moans, malfunctioning equipment, and cars that won't start after a visit. Is Poinsett Bridge truly haunted? Known as the Girl in the Glass Coffin or Sleeping Beauty, Rosalia Lombardo is widely considered one of the best preserved mummies in the world. This is the story of her mummy, which apparently blinks. The girl died at the age of two of pneumonia in 1920. Rosalia's father was so sorely grieved upon her death that he approached Dr. Alfredo Salafia, a noted embalmer and taxidermist, to preserve her. Dr. Salafia performed the procedure that would preserve Rosalia, and for about a century the exact formula remained a mystery, lost to the grave with Salafia. In 2009, a biological anthropologist named Dario Piambino Mascali tracked down the eternal formula through Salafia's living descendants. According to this miraculous formula, the chemicals include formalin, zinc salt, alcohol, salicylic acid, and glycerin. The combination of alcohol and the climate conditions within the catacombs would have dried Rosalia's body. Glycerin would have allowed the body to mummify and salicylic acid prevented the growth of mold. The magic ingredient was zinc salt, which gave the body rigidity, essentially turning it into wax. She was one of the last corpses to be admitted to the Capuchin catacombs of Palermo, Sicily, where about 8,000 mummies are being kept. She soon became one of the most well-known. Her preservation is such that it appears as if she were only sleeping. Today, thousands of visitors visit the Sicilian catacombs to take a look at and admire this little girl that never had the chance to enjoy life. According to a Peruvian journal, scientists interested in learning more about the embalming techniques employed in Rosalia's body put a camera inside her sarcophagus capable of taking pictures every 60 seconds. What happened next came as a surprise. The images taken by the camera seemed to show the little mummy's blue, intact eyes were opening and closing several times a day. This weird phenomenon has been the subject of various speculation for some years. Is it really possible for a deceased person's eyes to blink? How can this behavior be explained? Some scientists said that the blinking is caused by the natural humidity in the crypt where she's kept. Just recently, Italian researchers have once again debunked the claims that Rosalia Lombardo opens and closes her eyes every day. It's an optical illusion produced by the light that filters through the side windows, which during the day is subject to change," Dario Piombino Moscali, curator of the Capuchin Catacombs, said. They are not completely closed, and indeed they have never been, he says. There are also some skeptics who say that the real body of Rosalia was replaced with a realistic wax replica. However, the child's coffin was x-rayed, and it has been discovered that not only a skeletal structure, but her organs were still intact. Her brain was perfectly visible, only having shrunk 50% due to the mummification process. At 
750 years old. Like many old buildings, Bordsall Hall has gained a reputation over the years for being haunted. Bordsall Hall is a historic house and a former stately home in Ordsall Salford, Greater Manchester. It dates back over 750 years, although the oldest surviving parts of the present hall were built in the 15th century. The most important period of Ordsall Hall's life was as the family seat of the Radcliffe family, who lived in the house for over 300 years. The hall was the setting for William Harrison Ainsworth's 1842 novel Guy Fawkes, written around the plausible although unsubstantiated local story that the gunpowder plot of 1605 was planned in the house. One of its many resident ghosts is a spirit called the White Lady, who is said to appear in the Great Hall or Star Chamber. This entity is said to be the ghost of Margaret Radcliffe, who died of a broken heart in 1599 following the death at sea of her twin, Alexander. The ghost of a little girl has also been seen standing near the bottom of the stairs. There are webcams overseeing the areas that are said to be the most haunted. An episode of the television program Most Haunted was filmed in the hall in 2004. Since its sale by the Radcliffes in 1662, the hall has been put to many uses, as a working men's club, school for clergy, and a radio station amongst them. The house was bought by Salford City Council in 1959 and opened to the public in 1972 as a period house and local history museum. The hall is a Grade 1 listed building. In 2007, it was named Small Visitor Attraction of the Year by the Northwest Regional Development Agency. The hall was closed to the public between 2009 and 2011 while it was refurbished and reopened in May 2011. This story was sent to me by Joanne Miller of Washington, Pennsylvania. Joanne was traveling on a long stretch of highway on her way back from visiting friends in Ohio when she had a mysterious encounter that may or may not have been supernatural. One thing is certain, the creature she crossed paths with on that dark, stormy night probably saved her life. This is her story. Joanne has driven more miles of Pennsylvania Highway than she would like to remember. Originally from Ohio, she travels home as often as possible to visit friends and family. Even so, she never has liked driving alone, especially at night, but has done so more times than she can count. On that fateful Sunday night in 1987, Joanne was more anxious than usual to get home. It had been raining for hours and the roads were wet and the sky was as dark as pitch. She just wanted to get home and relax before returning to work the next day. Joanne had been going through a rough patch recently with her boyfriend and had needed to get away for a while. Their relationship had been volatile for some time and what had started out as arguments had escalated into physical violence. Joanne had finally told her boyfriend that it was over between them. It had been a great relief for her to end the affair. Now that it was over, she was looking forward to the future and all of the possibilities that lie ahead. Spending a couple of days with old friends had really helped to ease Joanne's mind after the breakup. She was still about an hour from home, traveling down a long stretch of highway when something happened which would alter the course of her travels and perhaps her life. She was in the middle of nowhere when a large white dog appeared as if from out of the blue and ran across the roadway in front of her car. Joanne slammed on her brakes and skidded on the wet pavement in an effort to avoid hitting the animal. The car came to rest on the side of the road. Thankfully, she hadn't hit any other cars in her panic to keep from hitting the dog. She sat in her vehicle and looked around for any signs of the white animal that had been on the road only seconds earlier, but she could see nothing. The more Joanne thought about the creature that had darted in front of the car, the more she began to doubt that it was a dog. 
It had been larger than any dog she had ever seen, larger even than a wolf. It had been more the size of a bear, but she knew there was zero chance of it having been such an animal. After sitting for a while, cars whizzed by her, Joanne decided to get back on the road and head home. She was still shaken by the whole experience, and she wanted more than ever to get off the highway. She ended up turning off at the next exit and stopping at a gas station for a cup of hot coffee, something she would never normally do. She even sat at a little table that was set up near the coffee area while she sipped at the warm drink. The night's events kept running through her mind as she sat, staring out the window. She still wondered what kind of animal she had almost hit and where it had disappeared to. Realizing that it was now very late, Joanne got back in her car and pulled back out onto the highway, heading towards home. The eagerness that she had felt earlier to get home and relax was gone. She now felt as though something didn't want her to go home. She still can't explain what it was, but she just had a feeling that she should take her time. Finally, hours after she should have been home, Joanne turned down the street that led to her apartment building. She immediately saw flashing lights and emergency vehicles blocking the entrance to the parking lot. Some of the other residents were standing outside, so she got out of her car and went over to them to find out what was going on. With all of the commotion, she assumed there had been a fire. One neighbor, who Joanne knew very well, looked stricken when he saw her approaching. Joanne asked him what had happened, and his face went white as he broke the news to her. Earlier that evening, the neighbors had heard a ruckus in Joanne's apartment. They figured that it was Joanne and her boyfriend in the throes of an argument, which they were becoming accustomed to, so they didn't pay it too much attention. That is, until they heard the gunshot. Immediately, the neighbors feared the worst, that the boyfriend had shot Joanne. Several of them called the police, who arrived shortly thereafter and entered the apartment. It wasn't Joanne who had been shot, it was her boyfriend. He was found dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Before killing himself, he had ransacked the apartment. Joanne's clothing had been shredded and family photos had been torn up and thrown in the toilet. Joanne's cat had also been killed during the boyfriend's rampage. Through phone calls that the boyfriend had made earlier to family members, investigators were able to piece together what they think happened that night. The boyfriend, distraught over the demise of his relationship with Joanne, had come to the apartment to confront her. He had waited in the apartment for Joanne for several hours, destroying her property and killing her cat in his mounting rage. Finally worn out physically and emotionally, he had pulled out the gun that he had brought with him and shot himself. No one who knew the couple doubted that had Joanne been home when the boyfriend came to confront her, she too would have died that night. The relationship had been abusive and she had always feared that he would someday do her harm. Joanne couldn't help but think back at what had happened to her on the highway. If the mysterious white dog or whatever it was hadn't run in front of her car, she would have been home hours earlier. That one chance encounter had started a chain of events that had delayed her, thereby saving her from what would have probably been a fatal confrontation with her boyfriend. Was Joanne Miller just the benefactor of a lucky coincidence on that fateful night? Or did something supernatural step in and change the course of her journey, thereby saving her life? She doesn't know the answer, but she is thankful for every day that she wakes up. Joanne knows, but for a chance encounter with a white dog on the highway, she probably wouldn't be here today. It's true what they say. We never really know how often danger stalks us or how many times we are spared without even knowing how close we came to a violent end. The hand of fate truly is fickle. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so bad it's good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. 
you can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Supernatural literature is filled with accounts from some of the most haunted houses in America. Time and again we have seen the lists of places that every ghost enthusiast is supposed to visit. The Lemp Mansion, Winchester Mansion, Whaley House, Myrtle's Plantation, and the list goes on. But what about those houses that are not so widely known? Perhaps they are only local haunts or places that are off the beaten path but many of them are just as haunted, or even more so, than the American haunts that have become so famous. What follows is a look at just a few of the lesser-known haunted houses that dot the American landscape. Nemecolon Castle, Brownsville, Pennsylvania Looking out over the Monongahela River in Brownsville, Pennsylvania is Nemecolon Castle, which was once a famous site on the old National Road. The three-story mansion, with its ramparts and turret, actually predates the town and was built on the site of Fort Byrd, a garrison from the days of the French and Indian War. The castle was built by Jacob Bowman, a local businessman who owned a nail factory and a paper mill and was later a postmaster, justice of the peace, and bank president in Brownsville. As his wealth grew, so did his family. After he fathered nine children with his wife, Isabella, he decided to build the mansion, which was completed in the early 1800s. In the years that followed, the house was not only a family home, but also a stop on the Underground Railroad. It remained in the Bowman family until it was eventually donated to the local historical society, which maintains it today. Over the last few decades, the house has gained a reputation as one of the most haunted spots in southwest Pennsylvania. Staff members and visitors to the castle have reported strange happenings, from heavy disembodied footsteps to slamming doors, the erratic behavior of lights, and full-bodied apparitions. The ghost of a little girl who is normally seen in the middle part of the house has been reported at least a dozen times over the past decade. Others have sighted a small boy, a stern-looking older woman, a ghostly little dog, and even an older man who is believed to be Jacob Bowman himself. Tinker Cottage, Rockford, Illinois The Tinker Swiss Cottage in Rockford, Illinois stands today as one of the most unusual homes in the state. It was built by Robert Tinker, an unusual man in his own right. Born on December 31, 1836 in Honolulu, Hawaii to missionary parents, Robert came to Rockford in 1856. He was employed as an accountant by Mary Dorr Manny, the wealthy widow of John H. Manny of the Manny Reaper Works. His inspiration for his amazing cottage came during his tour of Europe in 1862, where he fell in love with the architecture of Switzerland. In 1865, after returning to Illinois, he began building his 27-room Swiss-style cottage on a limestone bluff overlooking Kent Creek. He surrounded his Swiss cottage with over 27 acres of trees, vines, winding pathways, flower beds, and gardens. A three-story Swiss-inspired barn was added to the property, which housed cows, chickens, and horses. In 1870, Robert and Mary Manny were married and became one of Rockford's most influential couples. Tinker became mayor of Rockford in 1875, was a founding member of the Rockford Park District, and the CEO of the Northwest and IC Railroad Lines. Mary Tinker died in 1901, and Robert later remarried her niece, Jessie Dorr Hurd. When Robert died in 1924, Jessie created a partnership with the Rockford Park District, allowing her to remain in the house until her death. After her death in 1942, the Park District acquired the property and opened the home as a museum in 1943. Over the years, visitors and staff members alike have experienced the hauntings here firsthand. 
from the sound of footsteps in the hallways and on the stairs, to voices, songs being hummed, and the eerie laughter of children. A home for terminally ill children was located nearby for more than 30 years, and often the children were allowed to play at the cottage. Could some of them linger behind at the place where they found happiness? Even skeptical staff members have been convinced of the hauntings as they hear things they cannot explain and have seen objects move by something other than earthly hands. McCune Mansion, Salt Lake City, Utah Located in the Capitol Hill section of Salt Lake City, Utah is the McCune Mansion, built by Utah South Railroad and business tycoon Alfred McCune in 1900 at a cost of over $1 million. Born to a British Army officer and his wife in Calcutta, India, McCune immigrated with them to Utah Territory after they joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints LDS. By the time that he was 21, McCune had become a highly successful railroad builder and was connected to other millionaires of the era. He was a partner in the Peruvian Cerro de Pasco mines along with J.P. Morgan, William Randolph Hearst, and Frederick William Vanderbilt. He owned business interests throughout Utah and in parts of Montana, British Columbia, and South America. He and his wife Elizabeth traveled widely, and at one point Elizabeth was entertained by Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle. McCune wanted his home to be an extravagant display of his wealth and financed a two-year tour of Europe for architect S.C. Dallas so that he could obtain design ideas. The new home towered over the surrounding streets and no expense was spared. It was constructed from red Utah sandstone, but other materials and furnishings were imported from all over the world. McCune and his wife lived in the home until 1920. Prior to moving to Los Angeles, they donated it to the LDS Church and it became the McCune School of Music. In the early 1950s, the mansion became the Brigham Young University Salt Lake City Center until 1972 when it was moved to a larger location. It was sold in 1973 and became the Virgin Tanner Modern Dance School. Since then, the building has been privately owned, often used for wedding receptions and other short-term rentals. Though it's unclear why, the haunting in the house began soon after the McCunes moved out. Since then, the list of strange reports has continued to grow. Under the stairs is a room that was once used for music practice, and although this is no longer its purpose, instrumental music is still heard coming from within. Two apparitions have been seen in the house, a man in a long black coat and a little girl who resembles one of the portraits that hangs in the house. The young girl has been seen walking in and out of a mirror in the west end of the mansion. Another odd report involves phantom footsteps that begin and end in the center of the rooms. There are also reports of items being moved about, furniture rearranged, lights turning on and off, and doors that unlock themselves even after being secured for the night and double-checked. The identity of the house's lingering spirits remains a mystery. Taliesin, Spring Green, Wisconsin Located in Spring Green, Wisconsin is Taliesin, a former summer home that belonged to its designer, Frank Lloyd Wright. It's become famous as one of the finest examples of his signature prairie-style architecture. But what most people don't know is that it was also the scene of a heinous crime in 1914 that left a haunting in its wake. Wright began building the house in 1911, soon after leaving his first wife and six children. He had been involved in a scandalous affair with Mama Borthwick Cheney, the wife of one of his clients. She left her husband to move to Spring Green while Taliesin was still under construction. Although Mama did not have primary custody of her two children, they were spending the day with her on August 15, 1914. Wright was in Chicago, supervising the construction of another project, while Mama and her children were eating lunch with several workmen in the dining room. A servant named Julian Carlton, who had been fired earlier that day, locked them in the house, poured gasoline under the door, and set the house on fire. 
As the people trapped inside tried frantically to escape, Carlton attacked them with a hatchet, killing seven people including Mama and her children. The tragedy destroyed the majority of Taliesin and most of the records of Wright's early work. Wright received a telegraph in Chicago and rushed to Wisconsin only to find the mansion and his life in ruins. Determined not to be defeated by this terrible turn of events, he rebuilt Taliesin in Mama's honor. But bizarrely, the second house also met with tragedy. In April 1925, a lightning storm started a fire in the house's telephone lines and it burned to the ground. Defiant against the forces of nature, Wright built a third incarnation of Taliesin on the same site and it has survived to this day. Taliesin is one of the most visited of Wright's homes in the country and the most haunted. After the murderous events of 1914, the bodies of the victims were taken to a cottage on the property called Tanyaderi. It is in and around this cottage where Mama's ghost has been reported over the years. She is usually dressed in a long white gown, and while she is a peaceful presence, she is obviously restless and lost. It is also said that doors and windows open and close by themselves within the cottage, and lights sometimes turn on and off. Witnesses say that they sometimes close the place for the night, only to return the following day to find everything wide open. The events of the past have truly marked the house as a haunted place that will be forever linked to a tragedy of long ago. Prospect Place, Trinway, Ohio The unique mansion known as Prospect Place in the tiny town of Trinway was built by George W. Adams, who came to Ohio from Virginia in 1808. Already wealthy, Adams had inherited his grandfather's plantation but had freed all of the slaves his family owned before selling the farm. Adams hated slavery and chose Ohio as his new home because it was a free state. Within two decades, he was one of the wealthiest men in the region. He owned two flour mills, built bridges and canals, and helped develop the town of Dresden. In addition, he provided free grain for the poor and offered his home as a safe house for slaves who escaped the South using the Underground Railroad. He built the Greek Revival-style Prospect Place in 1856. It was the first house in the state to have indoor plumbing and was fitted with a cupola on top of the house where a signal light could alert runaway slaves that the place offered food and shelter. Injured, sick, or wounded slaves who did not survive their journey to freedom are among the spirits still believed to linger in the house. George Adams lived long enough to see slavery abolished in America before he died in 1879. He left his vast estate to his children, but over the years relatives squandered it and by the middle of the 1950s, the house was abandoned. It was later sold to the Cox Gravel Company, which offered tours of the mansion, but it steadily declined. By the 1980s, time and vandals had reduced the place almost to ruins, and it was slated for destruction. If not for the attention paid to the house by the famous Longerberger Basket Company of Ohio, it might have been lost. Company founder Dave Longerberger had recently purchased and renovated a number of historic buildings in the area, and he wanted to restore Prospect Place. Unfortunately, he passed away before work could be completed, but the house was rescued again, this time by George W. Adams, the great-great-grandson of the original owner. Work to restore and preserve the mansion is ongoing today. Prospect Place has long been regarded as the local haunted house by those who live in the area. The stories of the hauntings date back many years, and if even a portion of them are true, it is one of the most haunted houses in the state. In addition to the spirits of former slaves who linger in the house, there are also the ghosts of train accident victims who haunt the basement. After an accident on a nearby rail line, the wounded were brought to Prospect Place and the basement was turned into a temporary hospital. Their ghosts are now believed to haunt the underground rooms. Another ghost is believed to be that of a young girl who died in an accident at the house. Her ghost has been seen playing inside and outside of the mansion, 
and her girlish laughter has been frequently reported. A ghost who has been seen near a staircase on an upper floor is thought to be George W. Adams himself, or perhaps the spirit of William Cox, Adams' son-in-law, who mysteriously vanished in 1886 after absconding with a large part of his wife's inheritance. Some believe that he has been forced in death to return to the place where he carried out his betrayal. Edinburgh, Scotland's legendary underground city of the dead is one of the most famous supernatural sites in Scotland. The Edinburgh vaults have a dark and unpleasant history. When you enter the vaults, you find yourself in a very cold place where the darkness is almost absolute. Light seems to simply dissipate in the cavernous space, a maze of tunnels and nooks, sometimes opening up into cavernous spaces, other times leading into claustrophobic corners. The Edinburgh vaults are a series of chambers formed in the 19 arches of the South Bridge in Edinburgh, Scotland, which was completed in 1788. It was deemed to be an appropriate and fitting honor that the bridge's eldest resident, a well-known and respected judge's wife, should be the first to cross this fine architectural structure. Unfortunately, several days before the grand opening, the lady in question passed away. But promises had been made, hands had been shaken, and the city fathers felt obliged to honor their original agreement. And so it was that the first body to cross the South Bridge crossed it in a coffin. The locals were horrified. The bridge was now cursed. The majority of the townsfolk refused point-blank to cross the bridge for many years, preferring instead the awkward and impractical route through the deep valley of the Cowgate. Today, it's easy to say that 18th-century Edinburghers were overly superstitious, but over the following centuries, it slowly became apparent that they might, in fact, have had a point. Now let's return back to the subject of the frightening underground city that lies beneath Edinburgh. For about 30 years, the vaults were used to house taverns, cobblers, and other tradesmen, and as a storage space for smugglers and a hideout for criminals. It is said even serial killers Burke and Hare used the vaults as a storage place, and later they sold corpses to medical schools. When the conditions in the vaults deteriorated as a result of damp and poor air quality, the businesses left, and the very poorest of Edinburgh's citizens moved in, though by around 1820 even they are believed to have left as well. Before then, however, plenty had died, some murdered, others of sickness. It is not known when the vaults complex was closed down, with some suggesting as early as 1835 and others as late as 1875. Written records regarding the vaults' use during their slum times are virtually non-existent. All that is known is that at some point tons of rubble were dumped into the vaults, making them inaccessible. The vaults were rediscovered by former Scottish rugby internationalist Nori Rowan after he found a tunnel leading to them in the 1980s. About ten years later, Nori Rowan and his son excavated the vaults and removed hundreds of tons of rubble by hand. Today, the vaults on the north side of the Cowgate arch from a series of tunnels and vaults and are mainly used for ghost tours. Reports of ghosts were so frequent that media and scholars took interest in this uncanny dark place. This is a very sinister place. There are lots of dark, dark spirits down here," said Nicola Wright, who has worked in and around the vaults for many years. One of the most commonly sighted ghosts is the figure of a jack who tugs at people's trousers or throws stones across the empty echoing chambers. Then there is Mr. Boots. He earned his name because of the footsteps he makes as he tramps around the afterlife. The worst of them all is Watcher, a spirit reported to instill feelings of dread in psychics and who, as the name suggests, is constantly watching 
although sometimes this will move into pushing, hair pulling, and other terrifying activities. The power of the Watcher is strongest in the White Room. People have come out of that room and found they had scratch marks or bruising, they've had their clothes torn, they feel very nauseous. If you take photographs, quite often faces will appear in them. I won't go into that particular room. He warns people not to enter. He shouts at people. He pushes people, according to Nicola Wright. In 2001, Professor Richard Wiseman conducted a study of people spending time in the vaults. In his opinion, people who believed in ghosts reported more supernatural occurrences than those who did not believe, and since there were more sightings and odd events in rooms the participants had been told were haunted, that much of the experience was created in the minds of the people who went in there. So what did people really see down there? We cannot tell, but there is no doubt that the Edinburgh vaults are creepy and the history of this place is sad and dark. As of now, most of the whole area is closed to the public and access is strictly monitored. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. On April 11, 1907, after being out for 24 hours, the jury in the Harry Thaw murder case announced that they had been unable to reach a verdict in what had become known as the crime of the century. Thaw was charged with the murder of renowned architect Stanford White. While there would be many other spectacular celebrity murders to follow in the 20th century, few would boast participants as famous or events as strange as those in the case of Harry K. Thaw. Harry Thaw was the son of an ambitious Pittsburgh family and heir to a vast fortune that had been earned by quartering the coke market, a product necessary to make steel. The Thaw family connections and wealth had managed to allow the family into the upper crust of New York society. Though well-educated, Harry Thaw was also considered to be rather odd, even by his own family. His school escapades and wild behavior caused his father to limit his allowance to just $2,000 per year. His doting mother supplemented this income with an additional $80,000, and yet Thaw bemoaned the poor state of his finances. He didn't believe that what he considered this paltry amount could possibly support his standard of living. One of Thaw's greatest expenses was the apartment that he maintained at a high-priced New York brothel. Here he would entice young girls with offers of helping them to star in plays and in Broadway shows. Once he had them in his clutches, as the house madam Susan Merrill later testified, he would rape the girls and often beat them badly for his own sexual pleasure. Merrill later stated, I would hear the screams coming from his apartment, and once I could stand it no longer, I rushed into his rooms. He had tied the girl to the bed, naked, and was whipping her. She was covered with welts. Despite Thaw's peculiarities, it is unlikely that he would have come to public attention if he had not become involved with a young woman named Evelyn Nesbitt. She had come to New York at the age of 16, and when Thaw met her, she was becoming known as an actress and a model. As a member of the chorus of the hit show Floridora, 
she was one of the beauties asked the musical question, Tell me, pretty maiden, are there any more at home like you? She also posed for a Charles Dana Gibson drawing called The Eternal Question and was described by some as the loveliest looking girl who ever breathed. Writer Irvin S. Cobb described Nesbitt in print as having the slim, quick grace of a fawn, a head that sat on her flawless throat as a lily on its stem, eyes that were the color of blue-brown pansies and the size of half dollars, and a mouth made of rumpled rose petals. She looked innocent, but her gentle beauty hid a more sultry side. Soon after arriving in New York, she had become the mistress of millionaire architect Stanford White. The red-haired hulking White was considered the most distinguished architect of his day. He had designed more than 50 of New York's most admired buildings, including Madison Square Garden and the Washington Square Arch. He was credited with being the single greatest influence in beautifying the rather drab brownstone New York City of the 19th century. Madison Square Garden itself, with its amphitheater for horse shows and prize fights, and its theater, roof garden, restaurant, and arcade of fashionable shops, was regarded by most as his greatest accomplishment. But there was another side to the acclaimed architect. He enjoyed mixing in theatrical and bohemian circles, was an avid partygoer, and, although married, loved pretty girls. After meeting young Evelyn Nesbitt, he seduced the teenager and gave her large amounts of money, expensive clothing, and jewelry. Evelyn remained with White until she was 19, and at that point she left him and became involved with Harry Thaw. He married her on April 4, 1904, when she was 20 years old. In the interval, he had twice lived with her as man and wife on trips to Europe and caused a major New York scandal when the two of them were evicted from a hotel where they were blatantly cohabiting. Despite ensnaring the girl of his dreams, Harry Thaw was slowly going insane. During the first 14 months of their marriage, Thaw persecuted Evelyn about her former relationship with White. He refused to allow her to use White's name and only permitted her to refer to him as the Beast or the Bastard. Once while crossing the Atlantic on a vacation to Europe, Thaw tied Evelyn to a bed in their stateroom. He beat her with a belt for hours and made her confess every sexual act in which she had engaged with Stanford White. To stop the whipping, she later confessed that she made things up just to appease her brutal husband, claiming that White raped her and forced her to pose naked with other women. Evelyn's tales only incensed Thaw even further, and he vowed revenge. He would sometimes carry a revolver around the house and would mumble to himself about saving other young girls from sharing Evelyn's fate. Thaw's revenge came on the night of June 25, 1906. He and Evelyn, accompanied by two friends, attended the opening of a play called Mamselle Champagne at the dining theater on the roof of Madison Square Garden. The theater was a frequent gathering place for New York society, and thousands of the city's wealthiest people were all in attendance. For the occasion, Evelyn donned a daring white satin gown and looked spectacular under the stage lights. Soon after taking their seats, she and Thaw noticed Stanford White being ushered to a table in the privileged section near the footlights. The play turned out to be a dull one, and in time the Thaws rose to leave. As Harry stepped out into the aisle, he looked down the length of it and saw White framed dramatically at the end. While the girls in the chorus sang a production number, Thaw walked down the aisle and stopped next to White, who pretended not to see him. He then calmly reached into his coat, withdrew a revolver, and fired three shots into the architect's head. Two of those bullets slammed into White's brain, and he died immediately. His heavy frame crashed forward on the table and then rolled over onto the floor. Thaw then changed his grip on the pistol, holding it by the muzzle so that it was plain that he didn't intend to shoot anyone else. He was arrested and taken to Center Street Station. Thaw was charged with murder and placed in the tombs to await his trial. After he was arraigned for murder, Thaw's mother, who was in England at the time visiting her daughter, the Countess of Yarmouth, announced that she was returning to the United States to stand by her son. 
She said, I am prepared to pay a million dollars to save his life. She hired the famous trial lawyer Delphin Delmas from California to defend her son. He would be opposed by the equally famous district attorney William Travers Jerome, who, upon hearing that the Thaw fortune was at stake for Harry's defense, stated, with all of his millions, Thaw is a fiend. No matter how rich a man is, he cannot get away with murder. Thaw's trial did not begin until January 21, 1907. In the seven months that preceded it, William Stanford White underwent a character assassination in the newspapers that was unprecedented for an American of his distinction and society connections. There were so many tales of his amorous activities that for even half of them to be true, he would have had to have slept with the majority of the young women and girls in New York. The most famous stories involved White's legendary Red Velvet Swing, which was secreted in one of the many love nests that he kept throughout the city. In this heavily curtained pleasure palace on the west side, he was alleged to keep the velvet swing hanging from the ceiling. In this swing, he would place his young women, dressed like little girls, and would wildly push them back and forth. It was said that he would peer lasciviously up their billowing skirts in prelude to more adult passions. The campaign of slander and vilification against White was masterminded by Ben Atwell, a press agent hired by Thaw's mother. She also financially backed a play based loosely on the events that occurred, or at least in the way that the yellow press had painted them. The play featured three characters named Harold Daw, Emmeline Hudspeth Daw, and Stanford Black. In this first scene, the Black character brutally assaulted a blind man asking for news of his beautiful young daughter. The play ended with Daw shooting Black during a performance in a roof garden theater, then declaring from his cell at the tombs, no jury on earth will send me to the chair no matter what I have done or what I have been for killing the man who defamed my wife. That is the unwritten law made by men themselves, and upon its virtue I will stake my life." The play was not exactly subtle, but it was popular. It likely had an effect on the legal proceedings that followed, for while the case certainly seemed open and shut, the trial lasted for more than four months. From the start, Thaw's attorney would claim his client to be innocent and that a form of insanity had made him want to kill White. And while Thaw may have been insane, he would state that his urge to kill had come from a mysterious force outside his body, namely that he was possessed by the spirits of the dead. The claim was supported by a doctor of medicine and a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science named Dr. Carl Wickland. The Chicago doctor's wife was a proponent of spiritualism and a professed medium. Three weeks after Thaw's arrest, Mrs. Wickland insisted that a spirit voice came through her during a seance and confessed that it had forced Thaw to kill Stanford White. The spirit told the group gathered in the seance room, I killed Stanford White. He deserved death. He had trifled too long with our daughters. According to Mrs. Wickland, the ghost identified himself as a man named Johnson. He had been from a lower social scale when he was among the living and denounced the wealthy, saying that the rich womanizers like Stanford White had no right to live, stealing our children from us and putting fine clothes on them. The spirit's daughter was allegedly a young girl named Susie, a 15-year-old model who had been the highlight of a bohemian party that White attended. She had risen out of a giant pie and exhibited her charms, which were scarcely hidden behind a wisp of chiffon. White was so taken with her that he plied her with champagne and, when she was intoxicated, took her to one of his apartments and seduced her. Later he turned her out, penniless, and she died at the age of 23 and was buried in a pauper's grave. In addition to Johnson's angry spirit, another entity also came through during the seance, he identified himself as Harry Thaw's deceased father. He defended his son and claimed that the young man had been sensitive to spirit influence throughout his life. The spirit added that he never understood Harry's actions when he was alive, but in death realized that his son's depraved activities were the result of having been a tool in the hands of earthbound spirits, evil spirits that ordered death. 
The ghost went on to add explicitly that Harry Thaw was obsessed by revengeful spirits when he killed Stanford White. It was certainly a novel defense and one that played well with the jury. Delphin Delmas and the other lawyers representing Thaw used it to muddy the waters while they assassinated the character of Stanford White. It only served to help the case that prosecuting attorney William Travers Jerome was curiously inept during this peak moment in his career. He lost his temper several times in court while his opponent stayed calm and clever. Delmas brought Evelyn into court looking very demure and innocent in sailor blouses and Buster Brown collars. A crowd of over 10,000 milled around outside, hanging on news that filtered from the building. Inside of the courtroom, spectators soaked up the steamy details of Evelyn's seduction and her descriptions of sex with Stanford White, some of which was alleged so risque that the delicate young woman would only whisper it into the ear of the judge. Evelyn first met White in 1901 when she was just 16 years old. A girlfriend took her to lunch at the architect's apartment on West 24th Street. A second man was there but left after the meal. White then took the girls upstairs to a room where the red velvet swing hung from the ceiling. He let the girls take turns on it as he pushed them. Evelyn recalled right up to the ceiling they had a big Japanese umbrella on the ceiling so when we swung up very high our feet passed through it. White did not lose touch with Evelyn, who he considered his new discovery. He met her mother by arrangement and suggested that Evelyn should have some dental treatment. He sent her a hat, a feather boa, and a long red cape. Throughout, he behaved with the utmost correctness. Evelyn testified at supper he wouldn't let me have but one glass of champagne, and he said I mustn't stay up late. He took me home himself to the Arlington Hotel where we were staying and knocked on my mother's door. Then came the day when Evelyn's mother left town to visit friends in Pittsburgh, dismayed at leaving her daughter alone in New York. When he heard of this, White immediately offered his services, promising to take good care of the girl if she was left in his care. He made Evelyn promise in front of her mother not to go out with anyone but him while her mother was away. White paid for her mother's trip to Pittsburgh, and the second night after her departure sent a note to the theater where Evelyn was appearing in Floridora and asked her to a party at his apartment. When she arrived, there was no one else there, and White lamely explained that no one else was able to come. He suggested that they have something to eat, and afterwards, White offered to show her the rooms that she had not seen during her previous visit. He took her up some back stairs to a bedroom, and poured her a glass of champagne. Evelyn later said her head began to pound, the room started spinning, and she passed out. When she revived, Evelyn was in the bed. All of her clothing was gone, and White was naked and lying beside her. There were mirrors all around the bed. Evelyn remembered I started to scream, and Mr. White quieted me. I don't remember how I got my clothes on or how I went home, but he took me home. Then he went away and left me, and I sat up all night. Evelyn implied that the two of them engaged in sex that night, but testimony of it was not admitted into the trial. White called on her the next day and found her sitting in a chair staring out the windows. She was obviously upset, but White reassured her. He told her everyone does those things. She asked if the various people that she had met at the parties with White also made love, and White convinced her that they did, but it was always kept secret. She was told that it was important that they not be found out, and White made her promise not to say a word about it to her mother. Harry Thaw was also smeared during all of the mudslinging that took place during the trial, although his attorney managed to make his bizarre sexual proclivities a further symptom of his madness, whether it was inspired by the spirits or simply garden-variety insanity. Reporters managed to dig up stories of Thaw beating and whipping young women, including a legal suit brought against him by Ethel Thomas in 1902. He had purchased a dog whip one day in a store, and when she asked him what it was for, he told her that he intended to use it on her. She said, I thought he was joking, but no sooner were we in his apartment and the door locked than his demeanor changed, 
a wild expression came into his eyes, and he seized me and with his whip beat me until my clothes hung in tatters. Evelyn has also suffered from the same sort of treatment from Thaw. The trouble began when they were staying at a castle that Thaw had rented in Austria. One morning, she had come to breakfast wearing only her bathrobe. After the meal had finished, Thaw accompanied her to the bedroom, where he ripped the bathrobe from her body, leaving her completely naked save for her slippers. She testified, his eyes were glaring and he had in his hands a cowhide whip. He seized hold of me and threw me on the bed. I was powerless and attempted to scream, but he placed his fingers in my mouth and tried to choke me. He then, without any provocation and without the slightest reason, began to inflict on me several severe and violent blows with the cowhide whip. So brutally did he assault me that my skin was cut and bruised. I besought him to desist, but he refused. I was so exhausted that I shouted and cried. He stopped every minute or so to rest and then renewed his attacks upon me, which he continued for about seven minutes. He acted like a demented man. I was absolutely in fear for my life. It was nearly three weeks before I was sufficiently recovered to be able to get out of my bed and walk. Why, many people wondered, had she married a man who treated her so badly? Evelyn's motives seemed clear. The desire for wealth and position. Thaw was apparently persuaded to marry Evelyn at her family's insistence. The alternative was a charge of corrupting a minor since Thaw, like White, had gotten involved with the young woman when she was underage. The trial ended on April 11, 1907, but after being out for more than 24 hours, the jury announced that they had been unable to reach a verdict. On the final ballot, it was later learned seven had voted Thaw guilty of first-degree murder, and five had voted him not guilty by reason of insanity. Thaw was kept in custody until his second trial started in early January 1908. This time, his ordeal was shorter, and on February 1st, the second jury came to the conclusion that something had temporarily taken over control of Harry Thaw at the time of the murder. They returned a verdict of not guilty on the grounds of insanity at the time of the commission of the act. Thaw had been saved from the electric chair, but he certainly wasn't free. He was imprisoned for life at the New York State Asylum for the Criminally Insane at Matawan, New York. Attempts by his attorneys and by his mother, who spent tens of thousands of dollars trying to get him declared sane, were protracted and unsuccessful. On the morning of August 17, 1913, Thaw escaped from the asylum. With the aid of a limousine that was waiting outside the gates, he fled and sought refuge in Canada. The next month, under pressure from the U.S. government, the Canadian Minister of Justice agreed to return him to the United States. He was jailed in Concord, New Hampshire, and fought a long legal battle against returning to New York. He was not sent back to stand trial again until December 1914. Meanwhile, Evelyn went on to become a vaudeville attraction. Her beauty wasted away before cheap audiences, but not before she became pregnant with a son that she stubbornly insisted was Harry Thaw's. When reporters pointed out that Thaw had been inside a mental institution for the past seven years, Evelyn swore that Harry had bribed a guard at the hospital and she had been allowed to spend the night with him. The baby, for whom she filed for huge support payments, was a result of that one evening. In July 1915, a New York court pronounced Thaw sane and cleared him of all charges. Shortly after his release from jail, he publicly denounced Evelyn and denied that he had anything to do with fathering her child. Soon after, he divorced her and went on an outrageous spending spree, hoping to burn through whatever inheritance he could. Unfortunately for Thaw, he was jailed again in 1916. He was arrested for horsewhipping a teenager named Frederick Gump, and while Thaw tried to buy off the boy's family with over a half million dollars, he was still sent back to the mental hospital. He was kept there under tight security until his release in 1922. After that, Thaw continued his interrupted career of high living until his death in 1947. He traveled the world, 
sporting attractive young girls on his arms and billed himself to reporters as a theatrical and movie producer. Needless to say, Thaw never moved in entertainment circles and most laughed off his pretensions to a vivid imagination. Or perhaps it was something else. On certain occasions, Thaw's playful gaze would become a wild stare, and his mouth would open to emit strange words that seemed to pass incoherently from his lips. Insanity or influences from beyond this world? It was a dark and stormy night about three years ago in a suburb of Oklahoma City. My girlfriend and I were watching TV at her grandmother's house when we heard a loud boom. Suddenly the lights went out and all we could hear was the beat of rain and the roar of wind. No more than a minute after the lights went out, we heard a roaring that sounded like a tornado. It was just us there and we ran and hid in the bathtub with a blanket over the top of us. After about two minutes, it got quiet. Then the lights and the television came back on. We checked the news, but there was no report of a tornado near us. Gary England didn't even mention bad weather in the area. I felt the house shaking, so I went outside to take a look. I turned on the light to the backyard and saw that plastic cups were still on the patio table, that all the plastic chairs were upright. Everything was dry. One thing was different, though. On the table outside was an unfamiliar watch, still with the right time even. My girlfriend took the watch inside, and the next day, her grandmother told her it was her grandfather's watch, and she hadn't seen it in a very long time. So basically, it was a ghost tornado that never happened. To what lengths will someone go in order to survive? Does the survival instinct override their conscience and allow them to commit not only murder but also the taboo act of cannibalism? What happens when a person crosses the line from dark fantasy to real-life acts of brutal rape, murder, and cannibalism? Are these people driven by a desire so insatiable that they're incapable of controlling it? Murderous Minds Volume 3 Stories of Real Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the lives of killers who committed cold blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Authored within a historical context, each chapter is an unbelievable venture inside the dark and twisted world of real cannibal killers whose names and crimes might not be familiar to you. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies become reality, this audiobook invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness, from that of the killer. Along with a historical look at cannibalism through the ages, these stories beg the listener to answer the question, was the murderer committing cannibalism because he was incapable of resisting the urge to kill and consume, or is the explanation simply pure evil? Murderous Minds, Volume 3, written by Ryan Becker and Curtis Giles Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Two men, Tom Young and Keith Reinhardt, were both going through midlife crises. Both of them rented the same retail space in Silver Plume, Colorado, and both disappeared in the Colorado Rocky Mountains only one year apart. Even stranger was the fact that Keith had delved deeply into Tom's life and was writing a novel about him. The main character, Guy Gypsum, took on qualities of both men. Although hunters located Tom in 1988, Keith has never been found. 
and his bizarre case remains open to this day. Silver Plume is a quaint, historic town in Clear Creek County, Colorado. Early settlers had hoped to strike gold, but only ever found clumps of grayish ores that they deemed worthless. What the miners actually found was silver ore. In 1987, this tiny town only had around 200 residents. One of these, local man Tom Young, took his dog for a walk one day. Neither he nor his pet ever returned. Nine months later, in June 1988, a local sports writer in Illinois, Keith Reinhardt, was having something of a midlife crisis. He was about to turn 50 and wanted to accomplish certain things while he was still young enough. On top of that, living in Chicago was starting to take its toll on him. He was becoming more stressed and started to gain weight, lose focus, and wondered what the future might hold for him. Even though he held a decent job and was a married man of three years with two children, there was a void that needed filling. Reinhardt had an old friend called Ted Parker who owned the KP Cafe in Silver Plume and often mentioned a slower pace and quieter life there. So Reinhardt informed Caroline, his wife, that he wanted to spend some time in Silver Plume alone and work on a novel. Plus, by doing some hiking in the mountains, he hoped to get into better shape and overcome his fear of heights. Even though she was initially wary of this idea, she relented and allowed him to fulfill his dream. Reinhardt took a three-month sabbatical from work and departed for Silver Plume. He settled in and found a vacant shop right next to the cafe on Main Street that he leased in order to sell antiques and matted photographs. Not long after his arrival in this sleepy town, someone mentioned that the previous tenant of the space had disappeared without a trace just a year before. Reinhardt considered this to be an ideal story to tell and began to research Tom Young. Curiosity quickly turned into an obsession. Unfortunately, Reinhardt was beset with problems. The shop wasn't doing much business, understandably in a small town like Silver Plume. On top of that, he began to get writer's block and his inspiration started to wane. Reinhardt may have become a little disillusioned with how things were going, but he did love walking in the nearby Rocky Mountains. On the 31st of July, 1988, local hunters were patrolling the mountain wilderness approximately an hour's walk from Silver Plume when they found a skeleton propped up against a tree. Not far away was a backpack, a pistol, and the skeletal remains of a dog. It was Tom Young and his dog, Gus. Both had a gunshot wound to the head. This discovery helped bring additional details to light. Several days before he disappeared, Young had bought a pistol. Police treated this as a simple suicide, but others were not so easily convinced. Young was extremely fond of Gus, and locals couldn't see any reason for Young to shoot Gus at all. According to Unsolved Mysteries, ballistic tests were unable to match the bullets to the gun. The mystery of what happened to Tom Young may or may not have been solved, but there was one more to follow. A week after Young and Gus were found, Reinhardt closed up his shop for the day. The evening was drawing on, and Reinhardt walked all around town and to the cafe, and he told everyone he encountered that he was heading out to hike up to Pendleton Mountain. Those that he told assumed that he was kidding them. A round trip on the mountain would take about six hours. Sunset in Silver Plume in August occurs around 8 p.m., and very few people are skilled enough to hike the Rockies at night. Also, the elevation at the top of Pendleton Mountain is more than 12,000 feet, and the risk of exposure to the elements is very high, even in July. Wild animals such as mountain lions and bears can also pose a threat. Reinhard had no preparation at all and no suitable mountain gear or supplies when he was seen heading toward the base of the mountain. This was not his first attempt, though. Friends recalled that his previous attempt ended when he showed signs of vertigo. Reinhardt set a deadline of 10 p.m. for his return and departed at 4.30 p.m. This was the last time he was ever seen in the plume. When the following morning arrived, there was still no sign of Keith Reinhardt. The Colorado Alpine Rescue Team launched a huge rescue operation involving helicopters, 
search dogs, and many townsfolk. After one week, nothing had been found. Searchers knew that the rescue effort was not going to be an easy one, and at least one person commented that this was the classic needle-in-a-haystack endeavor. The search was finally called off on the 12th of August, 1989, when, sadly, a Cessna carrying two of the searchers crashed. Only one of the pair survived the impact. Two men that vanished under strikingly similar circumstances in a town as small as Silver Plume a year apart appeared to be more than just a coincidence. Friends of both men were at a loss to explain any of it. A strange discovery was found in Keith's home. Next to his computer, a newspaper article about Tom Young laid open. On his computer, the manuscript for his novel was not finished, but there was a passage about a man called Guy Gypsum. It read, Guy Gypsum changed into some hiking boots and donned a heavy flannel shirt. He understood it all now, and his motivations. Guy closed the door and then walked off toward the lush, shadowless Colorado forests above. From what friends can tell, these were the final words that Keith Reinhard had written. Was he setting the stage for his own disappearance? Reinhard did something else that may point to a setup. One week before he walked off into the mountains, he wrote a letter to the editors of the Herald newspaper where he worked in Illinois to tell them that when he returned, he wanted to cover the Chicago Bulls. This would certainly make a disappearance appear accidental. Almost as soon as he vanished, everyone began to speculate about the possible reasons as to why he vanished. Among these is the idea that Reinhardt had no intention of returning, that the whole thing was certainly engineered on his part. The night before he disappeared, Reinhardt was at a party and was seen talking extensively with a woman named Greta or Gretchen who was presumed to be from Denver. Could she have had something to do with him deciding to escape his life? The last passage he wrote can be taken into a different context if that was the case. He had uprooted himself and left behind everything that he had known already. Could he have done it again? Extending that idea a little further is the run-up to his own disappearance. Reinhardt had shown more than a healthy interest in Tom Young. Might have Keith Reinhardt wanted to be the new Tom Young? Reinhardt might have had issues with life in general, but nobody has admitted that he had some sort of death wish. There was also no record of him ever owning a firearm. Authors do tend to try and live the characters that they create, and perhaps this was what Reinhardt was doing. Perhaps his lack of preparation ultimately cost him dearly. An unforeseen injury might have had a more detrimental effect than it otherwise could have done. The terrain on and around the mountain is treacherous at best deadly at worst. The problem with that idea is that there was not a long time between the disappearance and the search efforts. Perhaps this was some kind of publicity stunt that ended up going wrong. The fatal crash of the Cessna might have convinced him not to re-emerge and chose to remain in hiding, perhaps even in a place like Mexico. There have been numerous sightings attributed to Reinhardt since his disappearance, but few of them have been dismissed by the authorities. There is another possibility, as well as their disappearances, both men had another thing in common – the shop itself. Some people put a lot of importance on this single fact. Both men might have become aware of something in relation to the store that they were not supposed to know. Reinhard may have met a similar fate or made a discovery that forced someone to act once more. For either supposition to be true, then surely someone must have had access to the store. That would suggest a local was responsible for both deaths if Reinhard indeed died on that mountain. Did the same thing happen to Tom Young and then Keith Reinhard? Could the same culprit have struck twice? Although there has been much debate and conjecture about this case over the last three decades, nobody is any closer to an answer.
Professor Bernard Carr is a professor of mathematics and astronomy at the Queen Mary University of London. He studied under Stephen Hawking and earned his doctorate at Cambridge. This is not a man to make up mumbo-jumbo to gain attention, nor is he in the habit of spouting half-baked theories about ghosts and aliens fabricated from baseless speculation. So when Professor Carr says that paranormal activity is real and that it's actually happening in another dimension, it's important not to dismiss him as yet another conspiracy theorist trying to become internet famous. In a talk at the EuroPA conference, Carr explained why we shouldn't be too quick to dismiss so-called paranormal events. Carr believes that there is a hierarchical structure to the dimensions, many of which we cannot perceive, but that the human consciousness is able to periodically perceive events that are occurring on planes of existence that we are otherwise usually unable to interpret. According to his talk's abstract, the model resolves well-known philosophical problems concerning the relationship between matter and mind, elucidates the nature of time, and provides an ontological framework for the interpretation of phenomena such as apparitions, OBEs out-of-body experiences, NDEs near-death experiences, and dreams. Consciousness is a difficult concept to nail down. Philosophers have been debating the matter for centuries. Scientists have likewise attempted to formulate a definitive explanation for what enables us to think and reason as human beings. Paranormal activity is rarely recorded with any accuracy, but some events have been reported that our current understanding of scientific laws simply can't explain. Rather than dismiss these occurrences out of hand, Carr recommends we consider the possibility that they might be a part of something we just don't yet understand. Carr's theory assumes that if these events are taking place, they probably are not happening in one of the three dimensions that we are capable of perceiving. If a person who exists in three dimensions were to place an object in a 2D space, it would appear to suddenly materialize to anyone within that world who has no understanding of a higher dimension. Thus, Carr suggests, what may seem like weird and impossible events could be easily explained if we take into account the fact that our brains are limited by the plane of existence that we're used to interacting with. Said Carr, since the only non-physical entities in the universe of which we have any experience are mental ones, and since the existence of paranormal phenomena suggests that mental entities have to exist in some sort of space. There is no way to prove Carr's theory, and as the news has been reported primarily by the Daily Express, it's impossible to guarantee the concepts he presented have been accurately communicated. Nevertheless, it's interesting to consider the possibility that accounts of supernatural events might not be as strange or bizarre as people think. After all, sometimes the simplest explanation is the correct one, and it's certainly easy to explain paranormal events by arguing that humans are dumb. Whether that justifies a belief in ghosts is up to you. The year was 1941 and the world was at war. Although they didn't know it yet, on November 22, 1941, the United States was on the eve of entering the escalating war that was raging across two oceans. It was a tense time on our planet, a couple of weeks before Japan would launch its fateful attack on Pearl Harbor, and Americans everywhere were scouring the news to keep a wary eye on the tumultuous events unfolding overseas. On this particular November day, two innocuous ads appeared in the New Yorker magazine for a dice game called simply the Deadly Double. The advertisements were seemingly harmless and looked similar to many other ads that filled the newspaper and magazines of the time, so nobody gave them much thought and certainly no one was aware at the time that these innocent ads would go on to become one of the most perplexing mysteries of World War II. The ads themselves, at first glance, seemed to have a sort of strange design to them, 
but are fairly nondescript for the most part. The first ad, which was placed near the front page of the magazine, has an illustration of two dice depicted in mid-tumble. On the visible faces of one die is written the numbers 0, 5, and 7. The other die shows the numbers 12, 24, and the Roman numeral 20, XX. The dice are positioned under a dramatic heading announcing a warning in a few different languages. Ax tongue, warning, alert. At the bottom of the ad, the reader is encouraged to see an advertisement on page 86, and the bottom reads, Monarch Publishing Company, New York. It was a little odd that the dice would have numbers that don't typically appear on regular dice, but it didn't really raise any eyebrows at the time. When one follows the instructions and opens to page 86, they find another ad that is more elaborate and appears to be the main ad, while the other is merely a teaser. It has the same heading of Octung Warning Alert, with another illustration showing an air raid in progress, and under that, a group of people huddling in an air raid shelter playing a dice game. At the very bottom is a stylized drawing of a double-headed eagle. There is also some copy written in the ad. The first part says, We hope you'll never have to spend a long winter's night in an air raid shelter. But we were just thinking. It's only common sense to be prepared if you're not too busy between now and Christmas. Why not sit down and plan a list of the things you'll want to have on hand? This is followed by a list of necessary items for an air raid. The list ends with another piece of copy which reads, and though it's no time really to be thinking of what's fashionable, we bet that most of your friends will remember to include those intriguing dice and chips which makes Chicago's favorite game the deadly double. This part is followed by the two X's inside of a shield within the double-headed eagle, and finally a tagline announcing that the game was available in department stores everywhere. The ads were perhaps in poor taste and certainly a bit weird, but many ads at the time displayed a certain dramatic flair, and nothing about this one in particular really caused any concern. It was not until Japan launched its deadly attack on Pearl Harbor, 16 days later, that a spotlight would be cast on the advertisements and their mysteries would become apparent. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese sent two waves of a total of 353 fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes which laid waste to the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and would be the trigger for America's active participation in World War II. The wake of the devastation would leave an estimated 188 U.S. aircraft destroyed, 30 vessels crippled, 2,403 Americans killed, and 1,178 wounded. It was in the aftermath of this shocking surprise attack that Americans became obsessed with the idea that traitors, Japanese spies, and Nazi secret agents were infiltrating the homeland. The FBI, for its part, methodically tracked down and arrested thousands of people it had deemed as subversives and were actively investigating every lead, piece of evidence, or rumor connected with sabotage from enemies of the state. It was during this rising tension and fear of the enemy among us that the FBI became interested in the New Yorker Deadly Double ads, and the previously seemingly harmless ads started to be seen in a whole new light. A large number of readers pointed out that the numbers and imagery in the ads were a little too close to the events at Pearl Harbor to be mere coincidence or serendipity, and the FBI started to think that perhaps the attacks were not as much of a surprise for some than it seemed. The ads were soon deemed to be a possible coded communication from Japan and Germany to their agents, spies, and sympathizers within the U.S., warning that war was upon them and the mystery of the deadly double would begin its ascent into the annals of great World War II mysteries. The ads were interpreted by the FBI as conveying several pieces of covert information within the innocent-looking ads, some of it subtle and some of it not so much so in retrospect. In the first ad, the numbers 12 and 7 written on the dice were seen as perhaps showing the date of the Pearl Harbor attacks, December 7th or 12-7. 
The numbers 5 and 0 were interpreted as signifying 5 out of 24 hours, or the time of the attack, and the Roman numerals XX, or 20, represented the latitude of the target. This left the number 24, the exact meaning of which could not be discerned but was deemed to possibly be some kind of code to identify the person or persons who had placed the ads. The second main part of the ad on page 86 prominently displayed a picture of an air raid in progress, which depicted what appeared to be bombers heading out over water, searchlights, and an exploding bomb on the water's surface, all imagery that suggests Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The double-headed eagle was reminiscent of a sort of combination of the two versions of the Nazi Iron Eagle symbols. Even the product of the ads, the deadly double, was seen to represent the two main Axis powers, Germany and Japan. Add to all of this that no game called the Deadly Double was found to be available in department stores as promised, or to indeed have ever existed at all, and all of these clues added up to being something that was seen as beyond coincidence. The FBI looked into the apparent publisher of the ad, the Monarch Trading Company, but found that the company did not exist, and so it was suspected to be merely a dummy corporation. The FBI then turned its attention to the New Yorker and conducted an investigation of their offices looking for answers, but instead uncovered more puzzles. It was revealed that the ads had been set into type somewhere else and their matrix delivered to the New Yorker by a white male who had not given his name. The man had reportedly physically passed the plates by hand over the counter at the magazine office himself and paid in cash. It was surmised that the man had likely created the place himself. The FBI was eventually able to track down a man by the name of Roger Craig, who they suspected as being the one who placed the ads. But in a menacing turn of events, it turned out the suspect had died in an accident under mysterious circumstances. When Mr. Craig's widow was questioned about the events, she reportedly told the FBI that the whole thing was nothing more than a coincidence. Finding nothing but dead ends and being swamped with an ever-growing deluge of other leads, the FBI dropped the case, and to this day it has remained unresolved. What was the deadly double? Were the ads a sophisticated, coded message from Germany and Japan to warn co-conspirators of the Pearl Harbor attacks? Was it just a coincidence or the result of people just reading too much into the ads? Over the years, there's been a good amount of debate on the nature of the deadly double ads and a lot of discussion on the supposed clues hidden within them. Yet there has never been any concrete resolution to the mysteries they pose. For now, these bizarre ads remain a somewhat haunting enigma and one of the most enduring mysteries of World War II. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. The Dardeen family met a truly disturbing end in their small town of Ina, Illinois in 1987. More than a decade later, a serial killer sitting on death row in Texas would claim he committed the crimes, along with more than 70 other slayings. Yet the truth of the Dardeen's final moments remains as uncertain today as it was on the evening of November 18, 1987, when police first discovered their brutalized bodies. The police visited the trailer because Russell Keith Dardine 
then 29 years old, hadn't shown up for his job as a water treatment plant operator at the nearby Rend Lake Water Conservancy District. Reportedly, Keith, he preferred to go by his middle name, was an extremely reliable worker when he neither appeared for work nor called in to report his absence. The supervisor placed calls to both of Keith's parents who said that they hadn't seen him. By evening, the police went to the Dardeen family home to investigate, where they met Don Dardeen, Keith's father, who had brought keys to the trailer. What they found inside was a crime scene so violent and gruesome that it would haunt everyone involved for years to come. Elaine Dardeen and her three-year-old son Peter had been beaten to death with a baseball bat that had been a birthday present to Peter from his father earlier that year. To make matters worse, Elaine had been pregnant with the couple's second child, a daughter, and the beating caused her to go into labor. The killer, or killers, had shown no mercy, however, and the newborn child was beaten to death as well. Elaine was bound with duct tape and gagged, and all three were tucked into bed together. The area had even been cleaned up, indicating that the killer or killers had been in no hurry to vacate the crime scene. The initial suspicions that Keith Dardeen had brutally murdered his own family were quickly laid to rest when his body was found the following day, lying in a nearby field. He had been shot three times and his penis was cut off. Police found Keith's car parked outside the police station in the nearby town of Benton, some 11 miles from the Dardeen home. Blood on the interior indicated that it was the likely site of Keith Dardeen's murder. Such a brutal crime would have been enough to shock a rural community, but the fact was that the Dardines were not the first victims in the area. Over the past two years, Jefferson County had been home to 15 homicides, including one particularly grim case in which a teenager living in Mount Vernon killed his parents and three siblings. While the spate of murders seemed unrelated, it was enough to drive locals into an intense state of fear. During the days and weeks following the discovery of the Dardeen family murders, locals took to openly carrying shotguns, and the coroner in nearby Franklin County was quoted as saying that locals were so afraid to let strangers into their homes that if he ran out of gas on a country road, he wouldn't even bother knocking on the door and would instead simply walk to the highway and hitch a ride. In spite of a massive investigation involving 30 detectives dedicating full-time work to the case and interviewing more than 100 people, the police were not able to determine a motive for the killings, let alone find a likely suspect. As time passed and the case grew colder and colder, Joanne Dardine, Keith's mother, continued to pressure authorities to try to solve the murders of her son and his family. She gathered more than 3,000 signatures in an attempt to get The Oprah Winfrey Show to do a segment on the murders, which were deemed too graphic for daytime television. Similarly, America's Most Wanted also initially passed on the case, though they later did a segment in 1998 that produced no new leads. It wasn't until the year 2000 that new light was thrown upon the brutal slaying of the Dardeen family. That year, a serial killer named Tommy Lynn Sells, who had been arrested after cutting the throats of two girls near Del Rio, Texas, began confessing to other murders that he claimed he had committed over the years while riding the rails and working at traveling carnivals. One of the killings that Sells claimed responsibility for was the murder of the Dardeen family. According to Sells, he met Keith at a truck stop or maybe a pool hall, and Keith invited him home to dinner where Keith then propositioned Sells to engage in a threesome with him and Elaine. Or maybe not. Maybe Sells just saw the for sale sign on the Dardeen's trailer and, with it, an opportunity. Part of the problem with the confession of Tommy Lynn Sells is that he didn't always stick to his own story, let alone the particulars of the case. When Sells first confessed in 2000, Joanne Dardeen was convinced of his guilt. As the years went by, however, her conviction waned, and by the time Sells was executed in 2014, her doubts were significant. Tommy deserved to die for what he did, she said, 
but I wanted him to stay alive until I knew positively he didn't do it. Though Sells confessed to more than 70 murders, at the time of his execution, authorities were only convinced of his guilt in 22 of his supposed killings. The brutal slaying of the Dardeen family wasn't one of them, and to this day, the chilling Illinois murder case officially remains unsolved. The ghost of a well-known impresario and a host of hauntings means that Cromer Pier is a magnet for paranormal investigators. Those spirits do love to be beside the seaside. It's the grand old lady of Cromer which allows visitors to walk on water and enchants everyone who sets eyes on her. It's unsurprising, therefore, that even supernatural guests have felt loath to leave. Originally built in 1391, the pier was little more than a jetty. Letters granting the right to levy duties for repairs suggest that the jetty was maintained until 1580, until Queen Elizabeth I granted the right to those who lived in Cromer to export malt, wheat, and barley for the maintenance of their town and towards the rebuilding of the pier. A 210-foot wooden jetty was built in 1822 but lasted just 24 years until the North Sea claimed it during a ferocious storm. Replaced it in 1843 by a 240-foot structure, the new pier was regulated by stringent bylaws which forbade smoking until 9 p.m. when it was assumed ladies would have retired to bed. After a storm, the town remained peerless for almost 15 years, until 1901 when a 500-foot iron pier was built at a cost of 17,000 pounds. A bandstand was built at the head of the pier within eyeshot of the drowned village of Shipton, which was later extended to create a pavilion. It is this pavilion which became the Pavilion Theater, which is of greatest interest to those who seek the unusual and the unexplained. Concert parties were played in the pavilion from 1906 and throughout the 1920s and 1930s, and the pier was host to a carousel of entertainment including Ronnie Brandon's Out of the Blue in 1936. In 1978, Irish impresario Dick Condon, one of the theater Royal Norwich's most famous managers, formed a partnership with Cromer Pier and the Seaside Special was created, now an institution which welcomes thousands of theater fans every year. Mr. Condon died in 1991, but it is said that his spirit can still be felt on Cromer Pier. Several performers have reported seeing him on stage standing next to them. Others have seen his shadow cast across the theater. In addition to those who believe the spirit of Mr. Condon is still at large on Cromer Pier, there have been a host of other ghostly reports. Moaning and shuffling feet have been heard. Mediums report communicating with spirits that date back to the 1300s. Ghostly members of a lifeboat crew have been reported on the boards outside the theater and visitors and members of staff have witnessed the ghostly apparition of a man in a tall black hat and another ashen-faced man with jet black hair. Members of staff have seen objects moving on their own accord, and bottles and glasses have mysteriously smashed in the bar. Figures wearing medieval clothing have been seen wandering along the pier, and ghostly cries have been heard from the sea. Performers and staff have reported the feeling of being watched backstage and in a particular dressing room, and mysterious disembodied laughter, singing, footsteps, taps, and bangs have been heard across the theater. People talk of a very intense and oppressive atmosphere occasionally felt backstage. The ghostly goings-on attracted the camera crews from Most Haunted in 2009. Yvette Fielding walked the pier with medium Patrick Matthews, who picked up on the spirit of a lady called Elizabeth from the 1920s who had apparently witnessed an accidental manslaughter on the stage. Backstage, Yvette had a spirit mimic her singing and saw an apparition while Stuart and Carl 
were physically affected by something unknown in the stage area. Gemma Snow, events director and organizer of Friday Nights Cambridgeshire and East Anglia, visited Cromer Pier with her friend Graham in February 2017 with a view to talk to staff about organizing a ghost hunt for Halloween. She recalls being taken for a tour of the Pavilion Theater and hearing footsteps and tapping in the auditorium, but assuming they had come from Graham, who was standing behind her as she chatted to staff. I turned to look round twice, and Graham had a puzzled look on his face. Later, it became evident that Graham hadn't made the noises, nor had he shifted his feet. He'd remained completely still and had heard the noises himself. As we walked through the stage door and entered the backstage area, I felt a little peculiar, she says. The only way I could describe the feeling is that I had walked through an invisible wall and the atmosphere changed instantly. It wasn't just a temperature drop, it was like a wall of sadness hit me. I can honestly say that I had never experienced this before. I was standing outside the notoriously haunted dressing room. The group's event was held just before Halloween, and two mini ghost hunts were held by Gemma, colleague Linda Hughes, and medium Ian Doherty. During a silent vigil at the foot of the stage, the auditorium was in darkness, illuminated only by torches. Gemma said, I heard a sound which made me turn my head to the right, and as I did so, I saw a black mass move diagonally across the seating area on the right-hand side. I immediately said, Linda, do you see that? To which she replied that yes, she had. A few of the guests also saw the same thing. Was it the tall man in dark clothing wearing a black hat who's been seen in the theater before? I couldn't say, but it's the closest description of what I did see that night. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard about during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories, authors, and sources I used in the episode notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marlar. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marlar on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marlar. Hey weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com listen.